Jackie Thompson is the ED and co-founder of Lifespin here in London. And uh, Jackie, you and I have been at this aspect of life, you know, fighting poverty, doing what we can for about a little over three decades each, uh, which is which is interesting. You know, we've 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 known one another uh, in that time, and yet we both kind of in many ways are forced to go into different directions into how we were going to handle it. How did you first get involved with Lifespin? How did that happen? Well, in 1989, I was studying anthropology and women's studies at Western. Hmm. And I came up with this idea for um, a thesis project through uh, the social work department, actually, to fit with my women's studies course, being a sole support parent mom, struggling in poverty, student loans, the whole gamut to follow my own dreams. Um, I became the touchstone person for anybody who was um, going through a separation, other social support parents, everyone tell their friends or relatives, call Jackie, she can help talk you through it. So I was finding that I was spending more time talking people through stuff and getting my schoolwork done. So I decided that at that point, I would start writing the answers down, typing them up. And so a manual started to be born from that which um, turned into my thesis project, which turned into our first publication that launched Lifespin In. It was a booklet called How to Get There From Here. And it was a self-help guide for social support parents who were trying to uh, look after their kids, build a life, fulfill their dreams, and get out of poverty. Yeah. A lot of programs that were apparently there, like services that people could access, when they actually tried to access it, they would run into all kinds of other barriers. So the goal was to give people real information on accessing the services. And then a group of women went with me two by two out to the agencies that offered the services to try them out. And we came up with some pretty wild experiences out of that. Mm -hmm. So that book was published four times. And now we try to keep the resources up to date on our website at www.lifespin.org and make information available to people to, to change their own situations. Yeah. Some people need help and guidance through that, and we do advocacy to help folks who need it. But by and large, if people have the information, information is power, they can work through some of the issues themselves. And we do other publications now that zero in on some of the things that they need help with. So we did one um, right at the beginning of COVID on wills and powers of attorney. We had a lot of clients wondering what they would do if they got really ill. So we put together a resource manual with a, a wonderful pro bono team at Western through the Western Law Program. Mm -hmm. And then last year we did one on accessing assist assistive devices because a lot of the folks that we serve are uh, challenged by disabilities and if they had access to some of those supports they could return to work or just live better yeah so that manual is up and then next year well this september we're planning on one regarding the disability services office we have clients who have severe behavioral or developmental disabilities and they actually have dso workers but they have no idea how to get a hold of them or what services they can provide so yeah. We want to pin down what they do and how to get them to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think I've, I've always seen Lifespin as the real deal. Um, I think that's the best way for me to put it. I, I just think for us as a food bank, for instance, it, it just got so big so fast. I, I, I just felt that uh, playing catch up the whole time. This is back in 1985, 1986. There was just so much going on. There was a recession, things like that taking place. And and I was a real novice at what it was that I was doing. But it seems to me that life's been, and I've known about it, you know, for a long, long time. You really work at the granular level. You you really work with the people that are suffering under the constraints of poverty or really feeling limited by it. And you've really tried to bring in forces to help those people on a day-by-day -day basis to meet the challenges, to move ahead. At a food bank, we don't do that. We just try to give out food to individuals and agencies and, and that's it. But we're very much aware that that's a very superficial thing compared to what it is that you are doing. It's important what we do. 
But what you're doing is you're working in the trenches with the people, trying to help them navigate a system that's often quite contrary and, and to help them through it. Was that your intention from the very beginning to, to be at that granular level as you saw poverty growing? Was that, is that where you were wanting to take life spin? Well, it, it, life spin just kind of happened um, because there was a group of us working together. Um, we set up our phones so they could call forward back in the day of such devices. So we didn't have an office. We were just a group of people that tried to help each other. So and to support and empower. If you're on your own, you don't always have that kind of help. So things like the free store were born from that. Um, if you have a good family network, you're not on your own. You might get hand-me-downs from older cousins to hand on to your children. But if you were truly alone, you don't have that. So the free store was a way of sharing hand-me-downs on a city-wide level. So children could access clothing that's it's not always new, but it's generally used clean yeah. and in in season. So the free store was born from that kind of just helping each other out. Our garden program, same thing. We have a pocket-sized farm program that we started in 1994. When we began the program, it was we did it at low-income schools. So we yeah. farmed with the children at the schools in the summertime, but that required a school contact person that would remain the same and principals have to change schools yeah. every five years or so so you wouldn't always have the support of the next teacher coming in so at that point we brought the pocket size farm program into our own backyard mm. and some of the schools still maintain the gardens where we started them which is really nice one turned it into a butterfly garden one turned it into a spice garden but we focused on moms who were on their own and trying to work when they had school-aged children. So between the ages of seven and 10, they're too young to stay by themselves, yeah. but too old for um, daycare programs. So that camp provided all day childcare all summer for moms who were, who were working. Yeah. And so again, that transitions. And I, I guess that's what Lysman does really well. We, the, the big word during COVID was pivot but we do change our programming to meet the needs of our clients. Yep. I find that, yep. I don't know if it's just London, but a lot of uh, programs are directed by what funding is available. And Lysbin doesn't operate on funding, we operate on donations. So we can very quickly address the needs that our clients have. So during COVID, we switched the program for the garden program to an online. Yeah camp program and we delivered um, manure and topsoil and seedlings and seeds to the children and did crafts and story time and STEM activities with them online. And that continues today. Um, so this will be our third year with doing that online. But what we found is, again, the population transitioned and we now have 130 children registered in the program as opposed to on site, we could only do 15 to 20 kids. So yeah. we're serving a lot more families and we're still getting together. So we have um, family outings with the kids in the nature park areas that we mapped out, also available on the website where the families can come and meet with us. And it's meeting with families is really important because we get to hear about what people really need. Before COVID, we had community dinners where people would come in and learn how to cook a low cost, really low cost meal. We'd cook it together and then we sit down and break bread together so we could have that fellowship with each other and and talk about real issues in their lives and that's how we design our programs is by what needs are not being met if somebody else is meeting the need we refer them to those programs we do not need to recreate anything that already exists we really try to innovate supports for people that are, are not being met in our community yeah that, you know, it's, it's interesting. There is a, a parallel there between uh, the food bank and Lifespin in that you know, we typically don't take funding either. We don't apply for government funding or anything like that. We know that's really needed elsewhere. Our stuff comes from donations. But just as you've said, I, I think that's really important. We, we've been able to ourselves change direction and have something of a renaissance in recent years. Um, because we had the funds because people donated them. We didn't have to go into an application process and wait for a few years to see if we would get the funding. 
the funding was there so we could go out and just start changing some of the programs that we were running or, or uh, directions that we were heading in. So things like greenhouses or depots around the city, those things were, were funded by the good people of London and the businesses of London. But the point was, is that we were able to just do it. We didn't have to go out there and ask for all of this permission and do it. And, and as great as that was, I think to be able to do it at the level that you're doing it, where people will come in and say, boy, I've got a problem with this, and you're able to make that shift and help the person in that. that that's at a much more practical, I think, and uh, pointed level than what the food bank is doing. And I think that I think that's just really important. I think to, to become so dependent on funding, for instance, from one particular source or always having to apply, it often can take that quick movement that people need as they're going through difficulties. It can take that out of the equation and it's difficult. How was COVID for lifespan? Uh, you know, when it, when it hit and came on to, what did you have to do there? Well, you touched on something that was important at the beginning of COVID, the great city of London was right on, on side with trying to come up with some solutions. Yeah. And they funded a lot of programs that enabled us to help people very quickly. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't these year long application processes yeah, and right. counting at the end of it, we were able to access dollars to get people food. And I know the food bank was able to do that and supported some of the work we were doing. Um, we set up a program with On The Move Organics company mm -hmm. to deliver um, fresh fruits, organic fruits and vegetables, supporting local farmers. We, we all know about the importance of sustainable farming practices yeah. and supporting our, our local farming. Um, so we've continued that program and their customers have come on site. So their customers actually continue to purchase one third of the boxes that we distribute every month. The food boxes. Yeah, it was a beautiful yeah. partnership that has just continued. And we did a, a welcome baby food box hmm. for our pregnant and nursing moms that mm -hmm. we identified through the year. So we had 200 brand new babies coming and we did a welcome baby hamper for them. The food bank donated us um, some baby food as well as diapers that we were able to put into the welcome baby hampers. And the, the On The Move Organics did a food box for them and Growing Chefs did a baby food making workshop Mm -hmm. it, like just enabling us to reach out and and help each other even as agencies is really important and, and i i thank the city for, for doing that that's over now but it was a wonderful opportunity for us to network with each other on how to serve our community quickly and efficiently um one of the follow-ups from that was um working with russia university we worked with their global studies program as did the food bank last year. Mm -hmm. And you gifted us with um, a greenhouse for our program. Yeah. And we didn't really have space for it here, but in Washington, the Aboriginal Family Center did. So we set it up over there yeah. and they've pulled in some other partners around it. It was not ready for this year, but I'm sure it will be like they had it set up, but they have to deal with water and bugs yeah. and squirrels yeah. and things like that. Yeah. But it was the idea that you were able to do that. And very quickly, it, yeah. it was a gift to the community to be able to help another group of low-income individuals start to grow food that yeah. will sustain them in, in the longer term. So we bless you for that. And, and we're so grateful that we were able to network together with other agencies around yeah. uh, addressing those COVID needs. And we have more of those if you need them, Jackie. We really believe in lifespan, but also we have the green walls, which are also capable of growing in places where, where greenhouses don't go into, but really happy to work with you on that. I think um, there are some agencies that I know and that we work with who during COVID did get a fair bit of funding that came from various levels of government and elsewhere uh, and expanded uh, in that time, but then it the problem became after COVID was done or was receding, some of that funding has pulled away. Uh, it, it has been withdrawn, and now they're stuck with these larger programs and are trying to figure out what to do about that. Did you encounter any of that, or were you able to stay nimble enough that that wasn't an issue? Well, with the like the food boxes, there's no way that we could sustain the number of boxes that we were putting out during COVID. Yeah. But that was meant to address the fact that a lot of the folks that we serve were like pregnant or senior or disabled, and they shouldn't be going into the grocery stores where they were in danger 
of getting really sick if they got COVID. Yeah. So the numbers that we had to serve during that time were really high and it was nice to have the funding available to do that. Yeah. But after the fact, life's been continues to serve yeah. low income families that have disabled people and seniors. So it was donations that enable us donations to lifespan and donations through the organic customers um, together we're able to continue to serve a, a, a group of that population that we still serve so we, we're doing um, about 75 boxes a month now still mm -hmm. and those are for folks who just really still should not be going in places where they're at high risk due to their health yeah what is houses for homes? I, I've seen that on your website and other things. How is that? How does Lifespin run that? Well, Lifespin has a housing. We moved over families. at the fire hall. Yeah. Yeah, we met over at the fire hall, I remember, but we didn't, we, we were doing the green market basket then. So we were doing the food box program ourselves and getting food from farmers and distributing it. That was, again, in, in response to um, an urgent need. So province cut social assistance rates by 21.6%. So we created the food box the next month in response to that. That changed over time and we didn't need to do that for the whole city anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that we had was this beautiful old fire hall that we used for packing the food boxes. But what we were finding is that we had more and more clients in need of housing. There was just not adequate affordable housing for them. So we sold the fire hall and bought the site where we are now, which enables us to accommodate 10 apartments, residential units for folks who are in need of housing. And we subsidize that ourselves. It's not subsidized by the city. We offer really, really good rents for people and they tend not to leave. So most of our tenants stay for a long time, um, decades which is great because there's a real sense of community here and they help each other. So tenants that need more support to keep living independently, they have that in the sense of community that we've built, yeah. built here on site. Um, we were gifted, someone bequeathed us um, $85,000 last year. And immediately we decided that we wanted to put that into building more affordable homes for families. Yeah. The wait list in London's over 10 years and there's not very much housing being built for families. There's a lot of uh, development subsidies to add stories on buildings and give below market rents, which are 80% of market, which low income people cannot afford. And they're short term. So their contracts are 25 years and they're single bedroom units. So they're, they're not touching anyone on that waiting list with that housing. It's it's sad. So we want to build some more housing that will house families. So we have um, now done a survey. It came through yesterday. And so we have a wonderful architect that's mm -hmm. going to work with us and try to develop some more affordable housing units yeah. that keep that sense of community and, and give people a sense of dignity and pride in where they live. Yeah. Yeah, that's really important. Just anecdotally, you know, when you went into that fire hall, I was a firefighter at that time. And I was involved with negotiations behind the scenes because we knew that, that, that Lifespin was looking to go in there. But it was on Adelaide Street, right? Adelaide and Horton, correct? It was Adelaide and Hamilton Road. Hamilton. And it was, yeah, it was owned by the city then. And they had it on, it had a heritage designation for the facade. And they were doing street widening and they were going to tear it down because they left the ceiling open with gaping holes and water. Literally, like we ran sheets of plastic into buckets that we carried out every day and felt like it was insane. But they were going to tear it down. And a wonderful developer who owned the office or was moving into the office where we were located on Queen's Ave helped us to negotiate with the city a fair market value because the city had as they get land it would be worth a lot more but we argued that it was a heritage property yeah. so it, it wasn't vacant land and they couldn't tear it down so that developer really helped us to negotiate a good price for that i remember property. that pretty really well but i worked there for a number of years when it was a fire hall and they always said there was a ghost in that place you never discovered that did you you weren't um, anything one of our board members you know, a native elder 
um, did a, a feast for the ghost to help us. Um, yes, so we had a cleansing. Yeah, we had a cleansing ceremony and, and a feast to um, address the issues that we were facing with that in the fire hall. That's fascinating. And also, uh, you've got a, an impressive board, uh, and but your president is from the Indigenous community uh, herself, right? And uh, so I think, obviously, that aspect of it, of working with Canada's Aboriginal peoples and, and, and doing what we can to bring in some of the elements and lessons that they have as community into what we're doing. I, I presume you're doing that on purpose, right? Uh, like many of us are, because there's so much to learn there. And we have been doing that for a long time. We did actually, back in the days of um, Ipperwash and the uprising there, we actually went out and stayed on on site at the camp I knew and that. did a community garden with the folks there and set up a free store with them as well. So it's it's not something new, it's something that we've, yeah. we've always done. Our community of low-income Londoners includes a lot of Aboriginal families and, and that's really important that we stand and support social justice actions where, wherever they take place. That's right. And I wasn't trying to imply that it's a new fad for you. I'm, I was aware of those days from the April Wash time. And, uh, you know, that, that, there wasn't so much the consciousness of things then that there is now, but you were in it but during the, when the times were very difficult. In the few minutes, we've only got nine minutes left, but would you mind if we just talked about poverty for a minute? I mean, I've, I've been at the food bank now 36 years. I've been through, I don't know how many recessions, just like you have, how many mayors, how many prime ministers, all, all that kind of stuff. And it seems to me that poverty and how we deal with it has really changed. And I remember in the first bank, food bank first got going, people were really surprised that there was poverty in London. And now we seem really kind of despondent that we don't seem to be able to do anything about it as far as getting rid of it, you know, tackling the things that they really need to. How, how do you feel about that? You've been there for three decades as well. So how have you seen that kind of metamorphosizing over the years? Well, there's been many changes. So, but a, a lot of the changes have come with a lot of political advocacy work yeah. by many organizations. So things like allowing families to keep their child tax benefits. That was a huge, huge difference to families that had children. Um, yeah. Back in the 80s, poverty was a, a dirty word. And folks like you and Lifespan helped to make poverty visible in our community. A lot of people, like yeah, it, that's right. it wasn't seen. It, it just wasn't seen. And I think we've done similar things with bringing housing to the forefront in recent years. We've done a number of reports to council and the free press has covered them very well. Things like vacant housing in our community, derelict housing, it, it was unseen. So, and the fire department deals with that a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I went out to a, a abandoned house in Lambeth to take pictures and I encountered a group of young children on their bicycles who were in looking at the burnt out building. Mm -hmm. um, the barn was burnt out, but the house was wide open with like broken glass and like they were in their play. Yeah. Those are high risk properties, not just for a community, but it's also land and it's also buildings that could be housing people. So I think we take a very narrow approach sometimes with yeah. affordable housing in our community. We have to broaden it to what resources do we have available in our communities? We don't want to house somebody in Argyle that works in Byron and she has to take her children on a bus to daycare and then take a bus to Byron to work, it, it, it's not efficient. So it impacts on employment when we don't have the employment supports like housing available in the neighborhood where you work. Yeah. So we have to have affordable housing in all neighborhoods. You want someone to look after your parents in an old folks home in Masonville yeah. then you want to make sure that there's affordable housing there for the PSWs and the, the yeah. staff that are going to work in that nursing home to be there so that they have a quality of life yeah. that impacts on the care that they're going to provide your loved ones. Yeah. Yeah. Jackie, do you get despondent? Oh gosh, no, no. I don't have time. <laughs> it's, I, I get disappointed in uh, the bureaucracy sometimes. Um, it is disheartening. Like last week, we had um, Jess Helmer made a motion to council to look at 
um, the rent sink program and to investigate the cost of doing such a program in London. And all he asked for was for staff to do a report on, like a, a business plan on how it would work for London because the numbers that they proposed were astronomical and, uh, and didn't match up with the population that Toronto does. And council turned it down. Yeah. Like, yeah, it, it's so simple. Some things are so simple and they just can't seem to get their heads around it that there's some little tiny baby steps that you can make to give us the information that we need to make things better. Yeah. So that kind of stuff is disappointing, but um, the, the, the coming together that we see and the people that help and the people that support us, like it's, it's priceless. And last, last week, I actually went on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday with the board member and we delivered the manure and the soil and the shovels to the families. Mm. Um, we have volunteers, a whole bunch of them come on Thursday to deliver the craft kits, but my vehicle handled the, the poop that <laughs> was very dirty and I didn't want to put it in people's, other people's cars. But I got to meet the moms and I got to meet the kids yeah. and hearing them and talking to them. And like one house we stopped at, we gave her the plants and she said, oh, I have some plants that I started that I'd like to share with the next family. Yeah. So we ended up loading up more plants into my van than we dropped off. Yeah. And it's building that sense of community that is so important and we can help each other and lift each other up. And I think that that's what we do best is that we try to empower and support people to have better lives for their children to have better lives and break that cycle of poverty. Um, things like registered education savings plans, teaching low income people about that's not a tax shelter for them, but it is extra money to put towards yeah. their children's education. And then it's not a question of, will you go to post-secondary school? It's where will you go to post-secondary yeah. school? Jackie, thank you. I, when I call, I spin the real deal. I really mean that. I mean, I think you have the advantage of working really on the ground with people directly and have, you know, I'm sure you've grown yourself as a result. Uh, you've been challenged in all of those things. But, you know, I, I really think it's important that London has groups like Life Spin who, you know, they're not trying to expand or get huge or whatever. They're trying to make sure that the people that they are trying to reach and help and, and give some light to have enough to get them by. And I, I just want to thank you for that. I mean, I, I think th those are the kind of things, those stories need to be told more about what Lifespin has done. And I know you don't toot your own horn, but I think it's really essential. Now that poverty seems to have become endemic in this country and we don't seem to be have the will to want to get rid of it at these big policy levels, the way that we maybe thought were possible before. It really is you standing in the gap and life spins panic standing in the gap. But we, we just really appreciate it as a food bank. And I think the community does as well. Jackie, thank you for doing all of that. And likewise, we send yeah. many folks your way and it's so important for them. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. being that voice and the service yeah. that you provide. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks for all the hard work. Thanks, Glenn. Okay.